Hello beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for dropping in and hanging out with me for a bit. I am so grateful that you are here. Today we are here to do my mid-month August wrap-up. Now, to be fair, it is not quite the midpoint in August. It is only August 12th, but since I only am able to film on the weekends, if I waited until next weekend, we would be already past the midpoint and I would have a bunch more books to talk to you about. And I already have several that we're going to talk to you about today. So I felt it was kind of smarter to go ahead and just film it now, even though I did just already post my end of July wrap up. So there are going to be like back to back wrap ups going up on my channel. So I apologize about that. But like I said, I do already have several books to talk to you about. So I wanted to go ahead and film this video. And as a reminder, I am part participating in two readathons in August. I'm participating in the Magical Readathon hosted by G over at Book Roast and the Amazing Readathon hosted by Brianna over at Four Paws in a Book. So if I remember as I'm talking about these books, I'm going to do my best to tell you what prompts they've satisfied so far within these readathons. So without further ado, let's go ahead and just jump right into the video. So I'm actually going to talk about the first book and the last book that I've read so far in August because they actually go together and I don't really have too terribly much to say and you're going to understand why in a second. So the two books are 12 Sharp by Janet Devon and Lean Mean 13, also by Janet Ivanovich. These are books 12 and 13 in the Stephanie Plum series. If you are not familiar with this series, it is a very long running series. I believe it started in the late 90s, early 2000s, and it follows our main character, Stephanie Plum, who is an accidental bounty hunter. She's not very good at her job, and basically what this is, is all of the shenanigans she gets into, as well as the quirky characters that are in her life. So really, these stories are just a good, quick, fun time. They're not very long at all. In fact, this audiobook was only six hours, so three hours of of listening time you can really fly through them they are fantastic palette cleansers they're never going to be really anything substantial but I promise that you're going to fall in love with the characters because that's really what these stories are about I actually have 46 minutes left in the audiobook of this so I'm not quite finished but I'm going to basically finish as soon as I'm done filming this video and I think I can say so far that this is probably one of my favorites I have laughed out loud multiple times in the story already in fact I was listening to it while I was getting ready to film and I had to stop doing my makeup because I was doing my eyebrows and I literally could not do my eyebrows because I was laughing so so hard at what was going on in these stories. They are short, quick, fast. They don't take much energy to get through at all. And so I know that when I pick one up that I'm going to just be able to fly through it very, very easily. And that is certainly the case with this one. And like I said, I'm enjoying this one immensely. It is just so funny. I love all of the characters. So I gave 12 Sharp a three stars and I'm probably leaning at like a 3.5, four stars for this just because I'm having such a good time with it. The next book that I picked up in the month of August was Parable of the Sower by Octavia E. Butler. I picked this up for two reasons. The first is that it's satisfied a prompt for the Magical Readathon to read a book with Earth and the title. Now technically Earth is in the series title, not the title of the book, but I went with it because I literally could find nothing else that I wanted to read that had Earth in the title. And also I needed to read an Octavia E. Butler book for one of the reading challenges. So it kind of killed two birds with one stone. Now this is a story, I'm going to be honest, that I picked up literally because I had to, not because I wanted to. This is a YA dystopian that was written in the early 90s. It is not something that I had any interest in whatsoever. So I didn't even really feel comfortable reading the story because it was so outside of my comfort zone. It was so not something that I would have picked up unless I absolutely had to. And basically the premise of the story is that the earth has been ravaged by environmental and economic crises. And in a predictable and typical move by humanity, it is all chaos and anarchy as everybody is desperate to survive. I would say the vibes of this story are very much walking dead, but without the zombie. Like it's very much a lawless place. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot of theft. There's a lot of sexual assault. The world is essentially nothing but crime and corruption. Like even the services that are typically public that you would rely on for help, like police services and ambulance services and things like that, you really have to pay for and nobody really cares about anything. So people are really on their own. On top of that, water is very, very scarce in this world. It only rains every few years. So if you need water, like you have to pay exorbitant prices for it. Same with food. Gas cars are also a luxury because gas is very unaffordable in this time as well. And as I mentioned before, government and law enforcement officials are basically all corrupt. So it's essentially rape, pillage, and plunder all day, every day in this story. And in this story, we are following our main character, Lauren. At the start, she's 15 years old. She is living with her family on the outskirts of LA, and they're basically in this walled off compound. It's kind of like a cul-de-sac that has been walled off to the outside world. So they are relatively safe. They are not necessarily wealthy people, but they are definitely more privileged than a lot of the people that live outside of the walls. But basically at some point in the story, a fire ravages the community and Lauren is faced to flee and go out on her own after her family is killed. But Lauren is definitely a very prepared person. She's kind of an expected 
expecting this all along so she's not necessarily afraid to go out there and do what needs to be done to survive and this is really following her story as she is out there she's meeting people she's inviting people into their little world and as they are trying to get to their destination wherever that may be so I do give this story props for being darker and grittier than I was originally expecting this definitely did not feel like a typical standard YA apocalyptic dystopian in fact it didn't really feel apocalyptic at all it felt very much on the more realistic side especially when you think about the fact that this book is set in 2024 at the very beginning of it we are only one year away from that and some of the things that are happening in this story feel like they could be very plausible today so there was a more realistic aspect to the story than I think that you get in other YA dystopian stories so I applaud Octavia E. Butler for the atmosphere that she created like I said very dark very gritty very gruesome very real a lot of sexual assault a lot of killing all of that goes down and she's very much aware of it and she knows what she's going to have to do to survive however there were still a lot of technical issues that I had in the story first and foremost I felt like the story lacked a lot of emotion which is really interesting because Lauren is what is called a sharer in this society and that she has like hyper empathy and she could really truly feel the pain of others physically and emotionally so if they are shot she can feel that gunshot wound herself but for all of that hyper empathy that she feels that wasn't really put into the story none of the characters were really likable you don't really get to connect to any of the characters it wasn't a character focused story it was definitely a plot focused story so I didn't really care about any of the characters I didn't care whether they lived or died I didn't even particularly like Lauren as a character so there was a distinct disconnect that happened in the story that really prevented me from emotionally connecting with anything that happened in it and on top of that I felt like there was very little to no context about the world that was given like the only reason why I know about the world at all is because I read a couple of synopses of the story before going in but almost nothing about the world was explained so you don't really know how the world got to be where it is today we are given just enough information within the story to understand that it is still our world it's still very much real world and like I said it's not really post-apocalyptic so there wasn't like this major catastrophic thing that happened like a zombie outbreak in The Walking Dead nothing like that happened it's very much still our world and you're given enough information to realize that but not much else so I felt like I was missing a whole lot of background information on this world and why it was in such dire straits and again that was something else that kept me from really connecting or caring about the story at all so I found myself consistently desiring more world building so that I would be better able to understand the characters and the situations and I just wasn't given that and of course I have to talk about Earthseed. Earthseed is essentially kind of like a philosophy maybe even a religion if you will that Lauren herself is creating. She's a 15 year old girl and she's writing down all of these thoughts in her journal about the world and how it should work her thoughts on God and everything like that so she's creating this doctrine known as Earthseed and so one of the big things that she wants to do in the outside world is she wants to create an Earthseed community. She really does believe that these are objective facts and that really everybody should believe in them and like I said she wants to create this community of Earthseed. That is her main objective in the world as it is and I just could not get behind it. I could not believe this 15 year old girl who thinks she knows absolutely everything is creating a philosophy that all of the world should have to live by and as somebody who personally has deep grievances with organized religion but we're not going to get into that. I just really didn't appreciate the start of the story and I didn't really think it added anything and I didn't think it needed to be there. You have this dystopian society where literally everybody is just trying to survive but you have this young girl who is basically trying to create a new religion for everybody to follow and I just couldn't get behind it. So ultimately as you can probably tell this story really didn't work for me. I didn't really like a whole heck and ton about it. I ultimately gave it a three stars. There were some parts in there that I found really interesting like especially once Lauren was beyond her family's wall and she was really out there trying to survive and some of the things that she and the people around her had to do but for the most part it was just okay. I'm not going to remember much about this in the future. I certainly wouldn't be continuing with the second book in this series. As I mentioned I only read this because I absolutely had to. It was not something that I would have picked up on my own so it just really wasn't for me. The next book that I picked up was Were There Two by Colleen Oakley. This satisfied a TBR game prompt of reading a booktuber recommendation. Sarah from Sarah's Nightstand loved and really enjoyed the story and I had it on my TBR and I thought it would be perfect. I ultimately ended up being able to use this to satisfy an amazing readathon prompt as well. So this story follows our main character Mia and at first glance she seems to have a very perfect and blessed life. She's young, she's beautiful, she's happily married to her husband Harrison who is a successful surgeon. They have a lovely home and they are about to start a family because Mia is currently pregnant. But there are definitely some complications in Mia's life. She is unemployed, she's an artist, she's a painter and she cannot seem to find work and on top of that prior to this pregnancy she has already suffered a couple of miscarriages. So this pregnancy is very precarious and she's already had a lot of grief and suffering with regard to her attempt to have a family. So there are definitely some big trigger warnings in here for infertility, miscarriages, infant loss, IVF, all of that stuff is in this story. So please be warned before you go into it because that is a large focus of the story overall and some of the problems that she and Harrison face later on. At the time 
the story is set, she and Harrison have recently moved from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania into a smaller city on the outskirts. And it is in this town where she meets Oliver, who is the brother of one of Harrison's patients who he recently saved. Oliver is definitely kind, he is charming, he is handsome. But what is most peculiar about him is that he is somebody that Mia has actually been dreaming about for years. She never met him before this time, but he is somebody that's been featured in her dreams since she was in college. And one night when they are all gathered together and she and Oliver are having a discussion, he confesses that he has been dreaming about her too. And so the two kind of pair together to try to understand why they have been dreaming about each other. What phenomenon is causing this to happen? And while this is happening, Mia's life starts to unravel. The life that she has built starts to fall apart in front of her eyes. And I don't really want to say more about why it's unraveling because that's all part of the story and the struggles that she is facing throughout. But basically she is trying to understand why she is dreaming about Oliver. She's trying to understand this deep attraction that she has to him. Like she has known him forever. There's very much a soulmate kind of connection between them and she doesn't understand it because she's never met him before. Meanwhile, things are falling apart in her life and her marriage and she's struggling with everything that is currently happening. And I really love this story, y'all. And perhaps what I loved the most about it was how real Colleen Oakley was able to make what was happening in this story. When I first read the synopsis of the story, I had two concerns. The first was the speculative nature that seemed to be going on in this story. Like how else could they possibly be dreaming of each other? I wasn't sure how Colleen Oakley was going to handle that side of the story. But Colleen Oakley did such an amazing job of presenting this phenomenon in a way that could actually happen and has actually happened to people in real life apparently. But on top of that, Mia deeply questioned what was happening to her as did everybody else in her life. Nobody took this at face value and nobody was instantly willing to accept that this was happening. All of the characters were questioning why exactly Mia and Oliver were dreaming of each other and they were all posing the same questions that we as readers were going to pose. Like is it possible that Mia and Oliver randomly met one day long ago in the past and their brains just kind of latched onto each other and now they're dreaming about each other. So there was a healthy level of doubt and skepticism that I think we as readers are feeling while we are reading this. But at the same time Mia understood enough about how important it could potentially be and she wasn't just ignoring it. So she wasn't accepting it but she wasn't ignoring it either and I thought Colleen Oakley did a really great job of creating that balance. My second concern was definitely the potential for infidelity because of course you have Mia who is happily married to Harrison and you can kind of infer that the ultimate point of these dreams was kind of to drive Mia to Oliver and I wasn't sure how Colleen Oakley was going to handle the situation. Was she automatically going to turn him into somebody that we hated and we wanted Mia to get away from? Was Harrison automatically going to be made the bad guy in order for a relationship between Mia and Oliver to work? But again Colleen Oakley really surprised me because she handled this in such a realistic and respectful way throughout the entirety of the story and I was honestly surprised at how much I was rooting for both Harrison and Oliver in this love triangle that wasn't really a love triangle. Harrison is a decently good man who deeply loves Mia. They have a lot of natural chemistry together. They've been together for several years but natural strain comes into their marriage when they're dealing with very difficult topics like infertility as well as some things that are going on with Harrison's job. But I love how Colleen Oakley broached it and how she handled the choice that Mia was ultimately going to have to make. And like I said, I don't want to say anything more about it because I don't want to influence your perspective on this book. I think if you are interested in reading this, you really just need to go into it blind and see what happens because I think everything about it was pretty much very well done and it exceeded my expectations, especially with those two points of concern that I mentioned. And the ultimate message of the story is really that you cannot live in the what ifs. You have to live in the what is and I really loved that aspect of the story. So I really very much enjoyed Colleen Oakley's take on a situation where there could be two potential love interests for our main character and how she went about that. Like I said, it was a love triangle that wasn't a love triangle and I'm not going to say anything more about that. I really just highly recommend that you go into this book and you read it because I thought that it was so very beautiful and I gave this a four stars. The next book that I picked up was Signal Fires by Danny Shapiro. I picked this up because I landed on the TBR prompt to read the shortest book on my TBR and this was it. I think it just had like maybe 220 something pages so it was not very long at all and I'm going to be honest with y'all. This is the epitome of a mediocre story and I remember almost nothing about it. Basically in 1985 there is this family. It's a doctor and his wife and their two children and their two children are involved in an accident that causes the death of the girl that was also in the car with them. And it's really just a brief character driven story about the parties that were involved in this accident and kind of where they are years down the road. And that's really it. I'm having a really hard time even articulating what this book is about or what my thoughts are on it just because it was so incredibly forgettable. Was this beautifully written? Absolutely. I really enjoyed Danny Shapiro's writing in here but I just do not understand the ultimate point and purpose of the story. And there was something that really irked me about the way that this was written in that it jumped around in time 
time for no particular reason. Like you're following the doctor who is the patriarch of the family. You're following him in 2010 as he is living alone. His wife is in a senior facility because she has Alzheimer's and you're following him as he has a relationship with a young boy that lives next door that he helps deliver. And then you're following him as he helps deliver this boy and his parents and you're following his parents through some snippets. And then of course you're also following this doctor's daughter and son, the two that were involved in the accident over multiple periods of their life. And it's not even in a linear format. It's back and forth. It's 2010. It's 1999. It's before 1999. It's 2020 during the pandemic. It is all over the place. I did not understand why this story was told in such a way, what that was supposed to add to it, if anything. There's actually a review on Goodreads. It was a 1.5 star review. Now I didn't rate this 1.5. I ultimately did rate it a three stars just because it was so incredibly forgettable. And I think that if I hated it enough to give it like a 1.5, two stars, I would definitely remember it more. But this person really sums up my feelings well. She says, I love character driven books and circuitous family dramas, but this felt absolutely directionless. Yes. And the way it jumped around from character to character and timeline to timeline only served to make me feel even more disassociated from the story. If you can say there was one and it's players because there really was no plot. Like I said, this was very directionless. This was very purposeless. Really have no idea where you're supposed to end up or what you're supposed to be getting out of this as a reader. So unfortunately that's really all I have to give you for this review. It was short. It was quick. I think it was overall beautifully written, but I don't understand what I was supposed to get out of this as a reader, what I was supposed to feel. If I was supposed to emotionally connect to these characters, I absolutely didn't. So unfortunately this did not work for me the way that I wanted it to. I went in there with very high expectations, even though it was super short, I was expecting like a very hard hitting emotional story. And I just didn't get that. And I think it's because of the way that Danny Shapiro opted to tell the story. So I am certainly going to be unhauling this at some point. Like I said, three stars, very mad, very forgettable, very disappointing kind of read. The next book that I ended up picking up was The Five by Hallie Rubenhold. This is essentially a nonfiction story that focuses on the five victims of Jack the Ripper. I ended up picking this up because for a magical readathon prompt, I had to do a pet pick. So I needed one of my pets to pick my next read. So I basically pulled a few challenge prompts from that challenge cup that I mentioned earlier. I put those challenge prompts on a couple of books and I spread them throughout my office. And then I put treats on those books and whichever one my cat went to first, I ended up reading that book. And so the five was what was selected. So not only did they select a book for me for this magical readathon, but it ultimately helps me satisfy some reading challenge prompts. So it was a win-win. We all know who Jack the Ripper is, right? He is basically a legend these days, but what do we actually know about his victims? And that was the purpose of the story that Hallie Rubenfold was trying to tell. She wanted people to know who his victims were and stop focusing on the person that killed them. Hallie Rubenhold obviously did a great deal of research for this story. It really felt like she fully immersed herself in the lives of these women so that she could bring them to life and we can focus on who they were as people rather than their victimhood or their murderer. However, my issue with the five is the same issue that I have with all similar nonfictions that are told in this style of format. At the end of the day, this is literally just a series of facts and data on the people that Hallie Rubenhold is covering. I am never going to remember a large amount of these details when I'm recollecting the story. I'm going to be able to tell you what this was about, but I'm never going to be able to go back and tell you about the individual lives of these women because as real as they felt to me while I was reading, all of those details just slip away. It is essentially kind of like reading a textbook and when you're done with the class, you kind of purge all of the information because you don't really need it anymore. And even while I was reading, I was getting the names, the dates, the facts confused because a lot of them were very, very similar. Not only did these women have like similar circumstances and ways of living and things like that, but the names of the people, not necessarily the victims, but the people in their lives were all the same because back during this time, it was very common for people to have multiple people of the same names within their families. And so there were all of these Georges and John. I was confusing who was who within these stories. And that just kind of went towards like mud all of the facts. So even though it hasn't been that long since I read this story, I really cannot tell you much about these women overall just because it was such a series of detailed facts about their lives, but it wasn't necessarily told in a way that's going to cement those facts in my mind that I'm going to be able to remember. And in fact, what I ended up finding the most interesting and fascinating about the story was how much you get to find out about what life was like for women during the Victorian period and the absurdity of how women were seen and viewed. It is just astronomically atrocious and the double standards that existed in society. I really just ponder the audacity of all of these mostly mediocre white men and how they thought that they were so much better than women for what point and purpose I have no idea. So that is what I really found very interesting about this story is that it really brought to life what it was like for women to exist in the 1800s in the Victorian era and before of course all of the bullshit that we had to deal with and this is actually a story I didn't read. This is a story that's really not a typical read for me. I'm not a big non-fiction person. I am a 
true crime person, which is what really brought my interest to the story. And I had heard so many great things about it. I am certainly glad that I read this. And I am certainly glad that I got to know who these women were because I literally knew nothing about them just because of how well known and sensationalized Jack the Ripper is. And now you get to know who these women are and you're really able to see them in a more three dimensional light. So I really appreciated what Hallie Rubenhold was trying to do with this story. Unfortunately, this is just something where like all the facts and details, they're not going to stick with me. I'm not going to remember them, but I will remember the overarching point and purpose of the story to give a name and a face to these victims and to kind of realize that they were born in a very, very hard time and they all lived very difficult lives. And so I really do appreciate what Hallie Rubenhold was able to accomplish with this story. And then next I picked up what has easily been the best book that I've read so far this month and possibly the best book that I've read so far for the second half of the year. And that is My Dear Hamilton by Stephanie Dre and Laura Kamoy. I picked this up because for the Amazing Readathon, I had to find a book that had three or more people on the cover. And this was surprisingly difficult to find. I had almost no books on my TBR outside of like really high epic fantasy that had more than three people on the cover. And I was just not about to dive into a high epic fantasy that was going to take me weeks to read. So I ultimately settled on this one. And then I ended up using this to satisfy a TBR game prompt of reading a book with red on the cover. I was originally going to read The Violin Conspiracy for that, but this ended up working just as well. And I wanted to go ahead and do this because this was a chonker, y'all. This was 672 pages. It is by far probably one of the largest historical fictions that I have ever read. And it definitely took me several days to get through, but I cannot even tell you how worth it this read was and just how it blew me away. It's about a woman who I feel is overlooked in the annals of history more often than not. And I'm so glad that this story exists. Now, this is what we would kind of classify as biographical historical fiction. So it's not a true biography. It is a historical fiction. It is written in a narrative style format focusing on Eliza Hamilton herself as though she is personally telling her own story. So this is told entirely from first person Eliza Hamilton perspective. Stephanie Dre and Laura Kamoy were able to create such a detailed, comprehensive, beautiful novel that told the story of this remarkable woman who dealt with so much grief, loss, betrayal, pain during her time. And all of this she dealt with such astonishing grace and steadfastness. I think we all know the story of Hamilton, if not through our history textbooks in high school and college, but even through the Broadway musical that is so phenomenal and is so worth all of the hype and the praise. I know that I personally am obsessed with it and I hope to see it again someday in my lifetime. Hamilton himself is probably one of the most important and influential founding fathers in American history. And of course, we all know the sex scandal that surrounded him. He was basically involved in one of the very first public sex scandals in our history. But we never really hear about Eliza's contributions to our country and what it must have been like to have been married to a man like Hamilton. Because for all of his brilliance, for all of his patriotism, for all the love that he had for his country, and even for all the love that he had for Eliza and his children, he was still a deeply flawed man. He was an extremely ambitious man and he was kind of willing to do anything he had to do to get to the top. He was always trying to overshadow his childhood because he was basically illegitimately born to a whore and that kind of haunted him his entire life. His birth was constantly questioned and he always felt that sense of disgrace and abandonment and he was always trying to outrun that. So he was always trying to build up his legacy. And so you really don't get to hear about what it must have been like for Eliza to be married to a man like that, but also the contributions that she herself gave to Hamilton in the helping of founding this country. And this, to be honest, is in part because there are very few primary sources about Eliza Hamilton and there are even fewer that had been penned in her own hand. And I think in some ways it is believed that this is intentional. It is kind of believed that it has been burned and thrown away that so nobody could access it. So nobody really could know how like Eliza reacted when Hamilton had an affair and all of the stuff that he put her through. She was not really kind of willing to let that be public knowledge. So we don't really know why there is so little primary sources on Eliza Hamilton herself. And so not only was the subject matter of the story phenomenal, but it was just so beautifully written. And I feel like these authors struck an amazing balance between using language and stuff that might have been used back in the 1700s, but while also mostly using a modern and accessible language that we would be able to read and understand. And in doing so, they really just brought Eliza Hamilton to life. And we were able to see things from her perspective. We were able to see Hamilton from her perspective. We were able to see her love for him and her country and her children, because despite all of his faults, despite all of his flaws, she recognized that there would be no America without Alexander Hamilton. And she was not willing to let that just fall apart. And so for years after his death, because she lived for over 50 years after Alexander Hamilton died, a portion of her life, just trying to make sure that he was not forgotten, that he was remembered. But also, of course, she had very complicated feelings on her relationships with Hamilton, especially after some of the things that she found out. She was such a complex and complicated woman who had a complex and complicated life. And I'm not gonna lie, y'all, when I was getting close to the end of My Dear Hamilton, I started to get a little bit teary, not because of anything that was happening within the story necessarily, but because 
because I just felt so incredibly bereft that I personally or we personally are never ever going to get to know Eliza Hamilton. We're never going to meet her. We're never going to truly see her in person and know her story. We're never going to get to hear it from her own words. But I just feel like she is somebody that really should be remembered. And if you like historical fiction, I cannot even recommend this enough. It was absolutely stunning. And even now I start to get like a little bit teary eyed and stuff as I think about how connected I was to Eliza Hamilton and how immersed I was in her story while I was reading this. So I gave this a five stars and nobody is as surprised as me that I gave that book five stars. So I absolutely loved it. It was phenomenal. And then the last book that I had to talk to you about today is A Touch of Darkness by Scarlett St. Clair. I picked this up because the prompt for the Amazing Readathon was to read a retelling and I read little to no retellings. I have almost no interest in retellings whatsoever. So I was kind of looking around for retellings and this one ended up popping up. And this is one that had actually been on my TBR for a while, but I had heard so many negative things about it, but I was just questioning whether or not I really truly wanted to read it. So I took it off my TBR, but since it popped up and it was a Hades and Persephone retelling, I was like, you know what? We're going to go ahead and go for it. And surprisingly, I enjoyed this a lot more than I thought that I was going to. So much so that I think I might actually continue in the series. So again, this is a Hades and Persephone retelling and it is set in modern day, but in this world, the gods are basically known. They have come to earth. They live on earth or in their own realms, but people know of the gods and gods and goddesses walk amongst the mortals. And so this story follows our main character, Persephone, who is the goddess of spring, but she's basically living among the mortals as a mortal. So most of the people in her life do not know that she is a goddess and she likes it that way. She's going to college. She's having an internship. She wants to be a journalist and things are going pretty well for her. And basically the crux of this story is she ends up meeting Hades at one of the clubs that he owns. So not only is he the god of the underworld, but he essentially runs a bunch of gambling dens and he loves to make bargains with mortals. And basically if they do not meet his bargain, he takes their soul. And so she is going to this club one night and she sits down and she sits down and she's learning to play poker from a man who turns out to be Hades. And she had no idea. And she also had no idea that by playing cards with him, she unknowingly struck a bargain with him. And so now she's being tasked to go to the underworld and create life. So you can kind of guess where it goes from here. If you know the story of Hades and Persephone, this ultimately ends up being a love story between the two. And this was just such a fun and entertaining time. It was definitely a sexy book. This ended up being so much better than I was expecting it to be. I do have some technical issues with it. And Hades and Persephone, it was definitely insta lust. It wasn't insta love because I do feel like they were in each other's orbits and messing around for a while before they actually told each other that they loved each other. But there was definitely insta lust. And there were definitely a lot of those moments where they like, they start to go at it and then they pull apart and they don't do anything. So there were kind of a lot of false starts, which I didn't appreciate. And I also really don't feel like we got a lot of world building or context. I would have really liked to know more about why the gods are on earth, why they came down, like what actually happened during that time, what the political structure is, how it all works. So I would have liked to see more world building in context. I definitely would have liked to see a more slow burn relationship between Hades and Persephone. Although I will say that Hades was fire. I absolutely loved him as a male lead. He definitely has the dark brooding bad boy aspects that you're kind of looking for. But yet, of course, he's on the more softer side. He doesn't really deserve the reputation that he has. Find out a lot more about who he is as a god. And I just love that. And like I said, my reading experience of this was just so much fun. I gave this a four stars. If you have read the Hades and Persephone series, and especially if you've read like Hades perspective, please let me know if you feel it is worthwhile to continue. Please let me know if you feel it is worth it to like tandem read the stories or what. I would love to know if I'm wasting my time getting invested in this series because y'all know that I'm in the middle of a million series and I'm trying to be very, very selective about what I do start and continue. So I would love your perspective. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are all the books that I read in the first half of August. As always, please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of the books that I talked to you about today and what your thoughts are. If you made it to the end of this video, but you are not feeling chatty, please go ahead and leave me an American flag emoji in honor of Mrs. Eliza Hamilton. As always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I aim to post one video a week, sometimes two, depending on what I could do. And I would love to connect with you in one of those other videos or connect with you on any of the other platforms. I always leave links to my Goodreads, Instagram, and IG threads down below if you would love to chat with me there. And until next time, guys.